Following the Oxfam problems in Haiti, the Commission of Inquiry set up to investigate the matter found that Oxfam should have acted differently and earlier to its safeguarding challenges. They argued that boards, particularly boards of charities that operate internationally outside the purview of the British public, should improve their line of sight into important issues. The key question then is, how does a board do this? How do they act differently and earlier? What is a, a board supposed to do in terms of its strategy process? And what do they actually do in practice? My discussion today is about the role of charity boards. And I look at charity boards as strategy practitioners. In the same way that we can look at doctors and say that they are practitioners who do a certain type of work and have certain conventions, routines and norms that they draw on for their work in order to be effective medical practitioners, we can also look at charity boards as strategy practitioners and also look at the norms and practices that they draw on in order to be effective strategy practitioners. Uh, this is called the practice perspective. So rather than considering strategy research in terms of uh, strategy content, what we put together in our strategic plans and how we can achieve better organizational performance through those plans, or looking at it through su uh, superior strategy processes, the practice perspective looks at strategy as the work of the board and looks at how boards can be better at this particular work. The data that I've used for this uh, discussion is from a survey of charities that we conducted um, last year. These are charities with boards in the UK and operations in Africa. Charities like Oxfam, Save the Children, etc. I'm particularly interested in this group of charities because boards there have access to the operations but that access is somehow limited by the structure of their organizations. These charities will face similar problems to for-profit organizations, but their problems will tend to be a bit more extreme because their corporate control mechanisms are, are different. In addition, uh, the Africa setting that we're choosing here provides added complexity. While there are historical ties to the UK and Africa receives the bulk of UK aid, charities operating there have to deal with deep ethnic and tribal cultures, influential religions, weak governance institutions, and norms that contradict ethical standards in the UK society. Not making a judgment here about which is better, but it is different and not something a board may be used to. So the sample highlights those situations where boards have limited access to operations and the whole strategy process is made more complex by the setting. The question is, how do get boards get involved or more involved in these situations where there's less contact, less connections? Can boards be effective in this kind of scenario? What does board involvement and strategy look like in this situation? So board involvement is usually seen as trustees getting involved in episodes of strategic decision making. So early scholars were concerned that charity boards should be actually more involved and engaged in work in what they called the new work of the board. And they argued that boards should be involved in implementing strategy as well as participating in ad hoc activities. There is still some debate as to how boards should be involved. And recent uh, research on charities shows that the boundaries between the board's role and executive's role is a bit of a blur. There's a lack of clarity between what boards are supposed to do and what they actually do in relation to strategy. So our research looks at this problem. Theoretically, what are boards supposed to do? And practically, what do they actually do? So we compared what boards do and what they're supposed to do using the practice perspective. In terms of what boards are supposed to do, we looked at 
the main board theories and kind of predicted to say, well, this is what the theories say that they should be doing. In terms of what they actually do, we asked them a question to say, well, in practice, over the last 12 months, what do you actually do? Now, the link between what boards are supposed to do and what they actually do is the board itself. When the board is effective, it is able to translate the practices based on the theories that we know into actions that relate to those theories. It's an efficient translation of practices into action. When the board is less effective, there might be a difference in that. Now, when we say effective, we're not necessarily saying that the board is doing the right thing, but we're talking about effective in terms of translating the practices that are predicted by the main theories, which are couched in these governance codes, and then what boards do in practice. There's a relationship between board practices and what the board does that is mediated or facilitated by the board in their role as strategy practitioners. That board is the important link and its knowledge and agency can determine how one is translated to the other because boards do have their own ability to think and to change things. They don't just take practices and apply them as they are. So we looked at the findings and we analyzed them in various ways. We found that firstly, charity boards are somewhat involved in strategy formulation, putting together strategy content, but they are less involved in strategy evaluation. Strategy evaluation involves monitoring the implementation of strategies, uh, maybe looking before a strategy is implemented to say, what is the chance of success? And then looking after the strategy has been implemented to say, well, how did that go? So boards are less involved in strategy implementation. Now, this may justify some of the calls that we've been hearing where they're saying, well, the board needs to be more involved in terms of a strategy oversight because there's a gap there. It could explain the challenges that Oxfam had. But we can also see why this would be difficult. And when we look through some of our data, we notice that boards may not be able to afford to collect some of the data that they need in order to evaluate strategies because, well, the operations are far away. So it is likely that they will rely on the executives out there to say, well, what is actually going on? A second thing we found is that when they do formulate strategy, they do it with managers in meetings and between meetings. So they don't form strategies alone at some away day by themselves, but they do it with executives. They also don't expect executives to do it alone, but they tend to work with them. When they evaluate strategy, they tend to do so by asking those probing questions. As I was saying, this could be because of the nature of the setting in which they, they, they are operating. So they're not collecting their own information or leaving execs to completely uh, do things as they, as they wish, but they are asking probing questions, um, probably because they are not on the, ground, on the ground to understand matters for themselves. Thirdly, our study identifies that monitoring executives and collaborating with them is actually useful for charity board involvement in strategy formulation. So both monitoring and collaborating are useful together. They are not in conflict. This is especially so in large charities and when time is allocated to the strategy process. We see that that has the effect of amplifying the impact or the influence of monitoring and collaboration. However, there were no practices that were strongly linked with the board's involvement in strategy evaluation. Of the main theories that we looked at, there were no theories that easily explained the board's role in strategy evaluation. There was a disconnect. For example, um, we would expect that the agency theory, which talks about monitoring executives and suggests that boards will conform to behaviors where they are constantly monitoring what executives are doing, that that would translate into board involvement in strategy evaluation, monitoring the implementation of strategy. 
However, we see that there's a disconnect uh, between that. Monitoring is not uh, translating into on-the-ground monitoring. The fourth finding is that with small charities, boards tend to be over-involved. Some are involved in the actual implementation of strategy. Now, this makes sense when you understand that many of the small charities and 70% or plus of the charities registered are small charities, they do not actually have staff to delegate to. So they will end up doing most of the work because the trustees are the staff. So it wasn't surprising to us to find this over-involvement of small charity boards. What was interesting though is that the governance codes for both large and small charities, they're two separate ones, both suggest that boards should not be involved in strategy implementation. So those small charities which have no staff, for them it is suggested that they should not be involved in strategy form, uh, implementation, which is quite a difficult situation. There's a mismatch between the advice given and what smaller charities actually do. So overall, our framework of charity board involvement in strategy um, suggests that strategy formulation and evaluation is not episodic. It is not something that happens um, just within, you know, at a board meeting, at a board meeting, at an away day, but that in between that, there are interactions during which strategy is formulated and evaluated. These could be chance meetings on uh, at, at a water cooler. This could be an email communication. This could be a, a WhatsApp message sent between a trustee and an, an executive, or it could just be a, a phone call. So it happens in between rather than just in the episodes. And so rather than seeing uh, strategy as content, as something that you sit down and you formulate, um, strategy is more, or strategy uh, formulation and evaluation is an ongoing social practice where given time, um, the, the results are seen and emerge from the deliberate and unplanned actions of the board um, and, and its executives. Um, the study suggests that boards of charities, when considered within this framework of the strategy practice perspective, are a bit of a weak link in terms of strategy evaluation because there are some practices that are expected that are not translating into what they do in, in practice. They struggle to access those practices that they need for evaluating strategies and carrying out the board tasks of strategy evaluation. Probably understandably, boards have a lot on their plates, um, which they do for free. Much is expected of them and they are held to very, very high standards. We think that it's time for additional guidance and support that makes it possible for charity boards to be more effective and takes into account the realities of what they do or what they need to do in order to promote their charity success. This is particularly so for the smaller charities. So what are we suggesting? We're continuing with our research, but one of the things we find um, when we look at the data is that if boards can find ways of increasing their engagement, then they will be able to increase their involvement in strategy formulation and, and evaluation. Now, what do we mean by engagement? Engagement means being able to conform to different practices, and that includes monitoring, that includes collaboration, because those kind of practices are interdependent and they, they, they align with each other. They are not contradictory. Um, another thing that we think that boards can do is to be more involved um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but using certain technologies to, to help that. Now, one of the charities, the small charities that we are studying more in depth, um, it provides a useful case for us. They make a significant amount of use of social media. In, in their case, it's, it's WhatsApp. They are teams on the ground who regularly send photos to 
some WhatsApp group or to individual trustees um, or to executives who are based here. And they've developed their own data collection techniques and timings that allow boards to have access to what stakeholders actually think or to have an idea of what's on the ground. Now, this is not something that we expect uh, trustees who already you know, have very little time to be WhatsApping and texting every hour. It is a controlled environment in terms of how it is, how the engagement happens. It is not somewhere where the messages are being pinged every day. And there's a format to how that data is collected and actually presented. It is presented in line with particular questions they're trying to answer, or maybe with a particular type of strategy that they're trying to, to develop. But what it does do, it helps the charity board to monitor on an ongoing basis and to connect directly with people on the ground and with stakeholders and key beneficiaries. It gives them data when they're trying to formulate strategy, that data that takes into account uh, beneficiary needs or answers specific uh, questions. And importantly, the data is in a, in a digital format, which means it has certain rights of use. It consists of photos, audio recordings, uh, video recordings, and, and, and text. And it, in being structured in this way, it means it can be used for other things and enables that board to start entering a phase of providing some kind of digital leadership, the, the strategic use of these assets, uh, we'll call them digital assets, to achieve the charity's uh, goals. Now, I can see this going further and going the other way around, where in times like COVID, for example, where people are requiring a bit of motivation or the board needs to be more visible, the board could do a little message and says, well, in times of COVID, you know, we understand the difficult conditions you're working with and this is what we're doing and continue the communi communication. Obviously, there would be certain people who would be responsible for that. For the smaller charities, yes, the board could do that directly. For the larger charities, they might have somebody who is doing that, but having that information still be able to filter to the board. Obviously, charity boards will have to get some skills in this. I know many trustees who don't enjoy using such social media. They actually keep away from it and it's like a nuisance and it gets into their lives. But it's one of these commitments that we're probably needing to make because in order for the charity to be successful, we've got to be within the digital space. And digital is an always on uh, 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 technology. So we've then got to find ways of just managing it, but we've got to be attuned to the idea that it is an always on thing. One question that you might have is to say, well, if our work is in, 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 in uh, Blantai, Lusaka, or in the rural areas in Zambia, well, there might not be much internet. Well, we can learn quite a bit from the diaspora communities and what they're doing and how they're communicating with these, um, with, with their relatives and friends out there. Despite the lack of, com of uh, communications and low internet, you will find that money is being sent to the most rural parts of Africa. This is because within those rural areas, you will find that there's patchy internet connectivity, but there'll be a, a store owner or somebody who has got internet, who shares his facilities, sometimes for a fee, but allows people to connect. So it is possible to connect using social media, even in those very remote areas. And so it is possible to have some kind of uh, digital uh, technology or strategy to assist in governance, even when your operations are very, very remote. Re uh, digital seems to be, you know, uh, taking uh, the practices of, uh, of tech innovations and, 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 and what we're seeing every day and, and using them to connect with stakeholders on a, on a regular basis and to respond to their needs. And I think the diaspora um, model seems to be working really well there. So those are our two suggestions at the moment, um, increasing this engagement by knowing that there are multiple practices that you can conform to, and then also increasing your involvement in digital, because digital allows you to connect directly with your stakeholders and to collect data that you can use to formulate and evaluate strategy.